with scripture where you can say, okay, now historically, Peter's first century audience knew that Peter was writing to the diaspora. Everybody knew that. And so when the diaspora read it, they knew that it meant them. That's true. He would never say the Gentiles, you're a chosen race. No, a chosen never, nation. No, he would never say that would make no sense. Okay, but now. It separates the historical language. Exactly. But now think about it. If you could conclude that Peter just called the church of Gentiles a chosen nation. You can make an argument. Then you've got a real argument because you could say in the Old Testament, Israel was the chosen nation. In the New Testament, the church is the chosen nation. Same language, so therefore the church is Israel, Israel's the church. Mm -hmm. See, that's why it's so, so, so important to say, no, there's a clear demarcation. There's a clear line of division. We're not even going to play the what if game. The fact of the matter is any first century Gentile reading Peter's letter would know he's not writing to me. It's only because we've had 2000 years that people can play that fast and loose with scripture and without thinking about who Peter wrote to or who Peter was the particular minister to or who his intended audience was. You can pick and choose and say, look right here, Peter says that the Gentile church is a royal priesthood. He didn't say that to Gentiles. It's not who he was writing to. It was never intended for them. And that is a fundamental way that church Israel replacement theologians work, is to find passages in Peter, John, and James who use Old Testament language about Israel and then say there, in the New Testament, language that was specifically Israelite in the Old Testament is clearly the church in the New. And then you just leap to conclusions. That's good. Okay, next little piece. Turn to Romans 9, 6. Did you follow that whole argument? Mm -hmm. Because oh, yeah, if you understand good. that, good. if you understand that, it will save you Tons of confusion. And when you see somebody reason that way, it'll jump right out at you. You'll go, oh, well, there's your mistake right there. Keep your finger on Romans 9, 6 for a moment. I'm going to read what this fella writes. You tell me what's wrong with his quote. Because this is one of my real pet peeves. When people have to eliminate words or add words or misquote scripture in order to support their theology, then there's something wrong with it. I think I told you many years ago about the book I was reading by a church replacement fella who, in quoting the New Covenant in Jeremiah 31 and in Hebrews 8, quoted it as being promised to the house of Israel, dot, 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 and, and off he went. The dot, dot, dot was, and the house of Judah, because he couldn't figure out a way to make Judah the church but he was arguing that Israel was the church. And so the new covenant was given to the church, the new Israel, the spiritual Israel, the true Israel, all this language that you don't find anywhere in the Bible. And he would just add an ellipsis wherever House of Judah popped up because that was just more convenient. That drives me nuts. So see if you can see what's wrong with this quote. The true line of Abraham, as we noted earlier, has always been those of faith. There's a lot of assumptions there. We'll worry about it later. Christ deprecated those physically born of Abraham and not spiritually born as having the devil for a father in John 8, 37 to 44. And those who were Israelites indeed, John 1, 47, would listen to him, according to John 8, 44 and 47. In other words, quote, not all Israel is Israel, unquote, Romans 9, 6. The dispensationalists disagree with the Lord and say the one physically born is indeed a true Israelite, favored of God and automatically heir to the promises, which promises include the land. If this were so, then why would the Lord call some Jews those of the devil? And notice above how the apostles interpreted these promises. So in other words, quote, not all Israel is Israel, unquote, Romans 9, 6. There we cited it. We're moving on. What does Romans 9, 6 actually say? What are the words? What does it say? So the word of God hath taken none effect, for they are not all Israel, which are of Israel. Of Israel. Did you catch that? See, there's a preposition in there. They are not all Israel that are of Israel. And the next verse continues the same thought. Neither, meaning it's a continuation of the same thought. So there's a parallel thought being developed here. 
So let's read the whole thing. Now read Romans 9, 6, and 7, and let's get the parallel thought. Not as though the word of God hath taken none effect, for they are not all Israel which are of Israel, neither because they are the seed of Abraham, are they all children, but in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Which means however you understand Romans 9, 6, you must understand it as a parallel of Romans 9, 7. Now Romans 9, 7 says that in Isaac shall thy seed be called, and not just because they were a descendant of Abraham. What's that a reference to? Ishmael and Isaac. Ishmael and Isaac. So his point is that even though Ishmael could be the oldest son, that God could pass him by for the child of promise, Isaac, and use that seedology language again and say, in Isaac shall your seed be called. So now the genealogy, the leading of the seed, the way to the Messiah is not going to go through Ishmael. It's going to go through Isaac. Now, we understand that of verse 7, but verse 7 begins with neither, which means it's a parallel of verse 6. So whatever we get out of verse 6, what we must understand is they are not all Israel nationally who are of Jacob, the progenitor, not Israel nationally. And his quote, not all Israel is Israel. That's how he writes it. Not all Israel is Israel. Is that what Paul wrote? No, he said they are not all Israel who are of Israel. Jacob, the father, the same way that not both of Abraham's children were counted as the seed, but in Isaac shall their seed be called. Verse 7 makes verse 6 so clear, and yet every Israel church replacement theologian, every one of them will use Romans 9, 6 in some twisted way to try to say, look, they're not all Israel who are Israel. That means everybody who's a believer is now Israel. That's the next jump. That's right where they go. If not all Israel actually has to be Israel, then some of Israel can be not Israel. Who's now Israel? So then Gentiles get to be Israelites now. Because you don't have to be Israel to be Israel. But believe me, read any church replacement theologian, and they will run to Romans 9, 6, misquote it like that fellow just did, leave the preposition out so that you think that... Say, if you sure. say your dispensation, I'm not saying. Well, they're not all Israel that are Israel. And I'll go, what is that? Yeah, can you misquote it any worse? Can you take it completely from its context? And it's a perfect example of seeing. Sentence is right. my favorite thing to say. Do you know the word eisegesis? Do you know what the word yeah. eisegesis means? You read into it. You read into it something that's not there. Exegesis, bring out what's in there. It's a perfect example of eisegesis when people say, they're not all Israel that are Israel. And what that means is Gentiles are now the true Israel or the new Israel or the spiritual Israel. You don't find new, true, spiritual Israel anywhere in the New Testament, but they get it from phrases like that. They're not all Israel that are Israel. So you don't have to be a descendant of Israel to be Israel. You're now spiritual Israel. You're now true Israel. Except that what Paul was doing was not flinging the door open wider to encompass more people. What he was doing was narrowing the field and saying the seed didn't go to Ishmael. It went to Isaac. And then within Israel, not all Israel was counted as the seed. It's going to go through Judah. And the genealogy is going to go through Judah specifically, and it's not going to go through Reuben, and it's not going to go through Ephraim, even though Ephraim has the land promise. And that is the flow of thought of Romans 9 when Paul continues then to say, and by the way, Isaac had a wife, Rebekah, who had two children in her womb, and then he gets into Jacob and Esau. Now let's follow Paul's argument, and you'll see it very clearly now with that context. You'll see very clearly that what he's saying is God has the right to pick and choose within Israel and to delineate which direction the seed takes, and that it doesn't always go to the firstborn. It oftentimes goes to Isaac. It oftentimes goes to Jacob. It goes wherever God wants it to go so that his purpose by election will stand. And it is a great passage on election, but it does not fling the door open and say, now everybody who believes is an Israelite. What it says is, within Israel... They are not all counted for the seed that God within Israel could narrow and delineate the seed until it came down to Christ exclusively. And that's his.